and we are officially live and I'm very pleased to announce that while we are supposed to be interviewing uh, Dr. Jim Green, we are, we're given a bonus surprise that uh, Jim is actually involved in something in Congress and is running a little bit late. So he has put in the very competent and very capable Rick Davis. Is that correct, Rick Davis? Yeah, you've got it. Steve. And and so so Rick and and and, and Jim are going to be working with us uh, throughout this interview. So I'm very excited because both bring a, a whole level of expertise that'll make this particular interview very interesting. And we're going to start off with uh, asking you the the basic question: What is it that you actually do at NASA? Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you for the invitation. We really appreciate it. So it's great to be with you guys. Um, so what I do is I, I, I came out of uh, human spaceflight. I did that for years on end. I did uh, worked at the Johnson Space Center in Texas. Um, and then I got sent over to Russia. I was there for three and a half years working. Uh, we joined the Russian space program with the U.S. space program in terms of the International Space Station. And there are all these other internationals that are participating, too. But we were, initially, there was, it was the two programs together, and so I spent a lot of time over there working with the Russian human space lab program. And then so now, actually, what I do is I work at NASA headquarters, um, helping essentially try to bridge between the human space flight community and the science community, because what we're really trying to do is uh, link these things, these efforts together so that we can really accelerate getting humans to Mars. Um, and so we have... Uh, I have a counterpart in the human space flight world that does essentially what I do, but we're looking for ways to synergize the efforts so that we really, really getting humans to Mars in the 2030s becomes a reality. And okay, so <laughs> but now we, we're going to shift back a little bit, and yeah. and I want to know a little bit more about how you got to where you are now, because I'm sure that it, uh, you know you did you plan always to work for NASA? Did you always want to become someone in the space world? Or did you take start off on one path and then move in a completely different direction? So I knew as a kid I wanted to work in the space business. Um, I used to watch Star Trek. I loved it. Um, I went into school. I did. I loved history and I loved math and science. I never thought I would do both. I actually did. I did in history. I studied uh, frontiers and then I uh, started doing educational programs for kids where we were bringing in astronauts to talk with uh, junior high schools and other uh, and other schools, and that was so much fun. I remember one time uh, flying in a helicopter with uh, Jack Schmidt, who was the, one of the last guys on the moon, and the moon was actually, it was, we had been to uh, like six schools, great schools that, with um, wonderful questions, and I remember this moon was rising over the mountains, and you could see it, and I could tell by looking at that guy's eyes that space was incredibly cool, and that convinced me I needed to go back to school and actually get a... Uh, an aerospace engineering degree. I actually got a couple of them um, because that was the way, the ticket, if you will, to actually do human spaceflight. And then I uh, uh, lucked out. We uh, have a, um, a really great co-op program at NASA. Um, most space agencies have these kind of programs for kids, which I really strongly recommend for those in your audience that are th have thought about that. Um, and literally, I was teaching John Young, who was you know one of the guys who walked on the moon within three weeks of be arriving there. And, you know, I, I, my first thought was, what the heck do I have to offer this guy? <laughs> but the reality was he needed a refresher on the thing I was briefing him on, and it was a tremendous experience. And then I became an instructor in uh, space shuttle crews and space station crews, and I went over to Russia, as I said, um, and really spent really most of my time doing human space flight um, before coming over to the science side of the house, which um, does some pretty cool things, too. I don't know if wow. I answered your question, but that's kind of a no. You, you you certainly did, and then some, and then so so um, you obviously had quite a few interesting jobs along the way. One of them is Capscom. What is Capscom all about? So Capcom is uh, it's a uh, it's it comes from the word capsule communicator. When we uh, were doing the Apollo or in earlier programs, uh, we had an astronaut that would be in the mission control center, being the one who talks to the crew. And the idea is that um, uh, that person knows the crew and knows how to efficiently, you know, convey information to them, but also um, sort of picks up their sort of personal, you know, things. There's a lot of nonverbal communication, and you really want to get that, particularly when people are under stressful environments. And so when we went to um, space station operations, that job has always been done by astronauts. When we went to space station operations, we basically had so many shifts 
for Capcoms that they couldn't just do it with astronauts. And so they opened it up to a few who were non-astronauts. I got selected to do that. And really, it was a tremendous opportunity because you literally are kind of living with the crews. You know, like uh, I worked one shuttle mission where I was the lead guy for their, doing their spacewalks. You know, and you're literally living out at the pool, practicing pool runs with them and that kind of thing. Um, and, you know, and it's really kind of bizarre because when you actually go do the mission, it almost feels like you're right there at the pool. You, there's sort of an, a surreal quality to it um, that you don't really expect. But the point being is that for Space Station, it was even more critical to get people who could kind of uh, empathize with what the crew's feeling because they're up there for six months. It's, it, um, and that's not even a Mars mission. You know, there and so little things you can you want to be able to um, really can hear what they're saying and, and get that down because there's a lot of communication that that's really implied that it really can make the crew more productive and and happier really and get their mission done better. So I did that for about 12 years and absolutely loved it. Um, uh, we had some just fun, fun opportunities, like we put the internet on board the space station, um, so uh, they can watch uh, hangouts like this. Um, but now, how do they get the internet on the International Space Station? Are you so, using, uh, using satellites? Yeah, it's using satellites, and we got it. But I mean, it would took forever because you know, like how everybody's worried about security and that kind of thing. So you can imagine the hoops we had to jump through to make sure that thing was safe. But that you know, that's an example of a project that I, you know, I don't think I could have been have been involved with had it not been doing the other stuff that I was doing, which is fun. And a lot of things like that occur on the space station. Well, one of the questions I asked, um, I, I think it was uh, Sam. Uh, Skumemi, he, he obviously is involved with the International right. Space Station himself. Uh, I asked, you know, would it be possible to have a Google Hangout like this and and actually have students from around the world participate and ask the astronaut questions? Yeah. So, um, so the interesting thing, so I think that kind of thing can be arranged. Um, well, I'm pretty sure it can, be, and I think it would be wonderful because I think this is a. Oh, I like what I'm hearing. Thing, yes. This is a great way for people to. Um, uh, realize that this stuff is doable and um, would just be a, uh, I think it would just be a tremendous opportunity and we really ought to try to pursue it is what I believe. Awesome. And I know that Mr. McNulty and Mr. Cunningham's class are there, so we're just going to say hello to each of the groups. We're going to wave at Mr. McNulty's group. Hello, Mr. McNulty. <laughs> <laughs> and we're going to swing over to uh, Mr. Cunningham's group. Hi. There we go. Hi. <laughs> Awesome. Great to see you and, all. And just to let them all know, we are here with Rick Davis, who's filling in for now, just for uh, for Jim Green, who is actually in Congress because he's got quite an important job. He he not only oversees planetary science, but he he actually relates straight to the government and has to talk about policy and do all the unexciting stuff. Or maybe it's exciting. I don't know. We'll ask him about that. So he is running a little bit late, but. That's okay because we are in the very capable hands of Rick Davis. Now, well, Rick, there I, are a couple of things. If I might, Steve, yes? you know, Jim just would love. I, 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 he really was excited about being here today because you, it's this is a great way to, for people to hear about um, planetary science and for him to learn from you, you guys. Because when you all ask questions, we learn. Um, and mm -hmm. he, uh, you know, he, the planetary science vision that sort of is just a tremendous vision because what they do is they're essentially doing all the robotic spacecraft out to not just Mars, but to all the planets out there. And we are, you know, we're learning so much right now about our solar system. It is incredible. I mean, you're, we're liber literally living through a knowledge revolution right now where people all across the planet are contributing to this. I mean, when you go, like, out to the Mars uh, Curiosity Control Room out in uh, California, it's a, it is really cool. Every day, people from all over this planet get together and actually plan out where we're going to send the rover. And it is a completely global effort, um, and you, and they literally do it with t things like Google Hangouts here, and get all the ideas on the table, and then they go send up a bunch of commands all the way to Mars, and that rover just diligently goes off and does it. Um, so wow. it's uh, it's kind of cool. So Jen really loves uh, doing the Hangouts, and he, and I think you give you a little sense of the kind of work that we do here in the division. I know I've got lots of questions, and I hope that the students have got questions too. Um, so what, what fascinates me is that one of the aspects um, that obviously the, the main reason that we're doing a lot of these hangouts apart from uh, democratizing science and allowing it to become accessible to young people is that uh, coming up in the next week or so it is the Humans to Mars Summit. 
Yes. And being involved in the technical committee, we thought it would be nice to make a lot of the NASA people and space-related people accessible to young people. So we are going to focus a little bit about Mars because Mars seems to be a bit of a hot topic at the moment. <laughs> and you play quite an important role in, in getting us to Mars. Can you tell us a little bit more about your role? So yeah, I'm delighted to. And, um, and if you can tie into the Humans to Mars um, Summit next week, because it's all online, that, that's a wonderful thing to do. I've, I've personally been to it a number of years, and just some great speakers there. So it just if that's an option for uh, your listeners, I really would recommend that. So what I do is um, uh, the big thing I'm doing is I'm co-leading an effort to actually pick where we're going to land human beings on Mars. Um, we started that about a year ago. Um, we have a bunch of assets or satellites in Mars. We have rovers too, and we really um, those things are getting older. And we, while that we are available to us, we want to use them as absolutely as much as we possibly can to um, figure out where we're going to send human beings. Um, because we're aiming for a permanent base on Mars, um, that's sort of a lesson learned from Apollo. But really, it's a lesson learned from all of history is that when you're actually going out into a frontier, what you want to do is you want to set up a, a base so that you can actually put supplies, food, water, all the things that you need to live. I mean, think about everything you need in your kitchen or in your home, and that, you need that out there too. And it even goes down to things like movies. I mean, that may sound dumb, but you know what? That's a big part of our lives, and you want to get all that stuff there with plain supplies so that in the bad day, if, say, something goes wrong with the habitation module and it de you know you have a decompression or whatever bad thing happens you have options to handle it and so like in Antarctica there is a McMurdo station that's there that is actually was a hut to begin with but now it's almost like a city that needs urban planning um, but if you're gonna go explore in Antarctica that's where you go you go there you get your supplies and you head out and go explore and so for Mars that's kinda where we're going and so um, I got selected to be a co-lead for this. We uh, have uh, uh, half of the team members are from the human spaceflight community, half of them are for the science. The science guys are really crucial because they know Mars, human spaceflight, the guys know human spaceflight. And so we really literally have them all working together because no one knows all the answers and no one ever will. Um, but by working together, we get a lot closer. And so we uh, set that into motion about a year ago. Um, we had a big workshop in October. Um, and it was, we had 400 people participating. Uh, and really, they were people from all over the planet. We had people in the Ukraine and France, all over. Um, and they were all pro making proposals of places where we'd set up this base on Mars. And the ideas were everywhere. And, you know, and so one thing that's kind of like brand new and cutting is we didn't used to know that there was w w water on Mars. Now we know that there was there were oceans on Mars, and those oceans are still kind of there. It's just they're frozen solid. A lot of some of it, a lot of it's evaporated, but the oceans are still there. And if you go far enough north, what you can do is you can literally scratch the surface and see pure white ice. Um, and that's exciting when you're thinking about a base because it just takes a little bit of heat, and you can turn that into water. You know, I I'm a sort of joke. You know, I got my little cup of coffee, but you know that coffee needs water. And humans need water, and if you look at the entire span of human civilization, it's always gone where there's water, you know, and so it's not going to be any different on Mars. So it's sort of this idea of a semi-permanent base, this idea of, need, of having water now, and we've got to figure out where it is. Um, and so we have initiated this process to do it, and we've actually started um, using our satellites at Mars to actually start imaging or taking pictures and studying these sites even more. And we have a ton more work to do to, to be able to pick it. We're probably not going to be able to pick it for a while, but we've started the process, and that's that's really key. I don't know if that wow. gives you kind of a... No, that's, that's absolutely. And and because you were involved with Capcom, um, would, would you then volunteer to, to do Capcom with the uh, astronauts that are going to Mars? <laughs> so, that's a really cool question. So um, d when you talk to somebody on Mars... I'm not even sure uh, my old job will exist at that point. I'm being a little facetious. Uh, because uh -huh. When you talk to somebody at Mars, think of a text message that you send to somebody, and it takes anywhere from 7 minutes to 22 minutes for the text message to get to Mars. So you, wow. can't, you can't really have a conversation like we're having right now because we're using you know, cables that are probably going underneath the ocean, and that's only thousands of miles. We're talking millions and millions and millions of miles. 
Uh, and and the seven to twenty-two minutes is seven minutes when Mars is closest to Earth, and twenty-two minutes when it's on the other side of the sun from us. And that takes twenty-two minutes for a hi, how are you, to get there. And so really, there'll probably be text messaging. And then the really cool thing is, you know, you know, you got these people that are on a whole other planet. I mean, we've essentially at that point become a multi-planetary species, which is really cool, you know. And the point being is we want to give them the computers, the know-how, the equipment so that they can actually make their own decisions because, you know, frankly, they're going to know Mars better than you know, almost anybody on back on this planet because they're living there, you know. And mm -hmm. I think um, we have to kind of figure out how to really sort of do that. And we can't be micromanaging them. I mean, they're, you just can't do that with those time delays. So that's why I kind of joke that I think my old job might go away when we start actually sending humans to Mars in 19 years, 19, 20 years. But now you're involved with policy with regards yeah. to actually landing on Mars. So yeah. apart from the technical aspect, there's actually a legal aspect going on behind the scenes. Uh, what happens if you find something? Who does it belong to? Uh, what happens if, if someone breaks a law on Mars? Is it also a law on Earth? I mean, are you looking at that kind of thing, or what other kinds of things are you looking at? So um, we will look at those things. I mean, there are people who are already thinking about them. I, you know, the biggest thing right now is trying to figure out how you do it because Mars is just hard. It is so far out there. You got to. Um, you know, how far is it? I mean, it, it can. You know, it's it. Uh, the number. I'm going to say it's like 100 million. I mean, it's long. I mean, it takes six months to get six to nine months to get there. So you light the engines in, in Earth orbit. And you are literally going to be traveling for six to nine months before you arrive at Mars. And then with the way the orbital mechanics or the way the planets line up, because you have to use that efficiently, when you do it, you're talking about a thousand day mission before you can even come back, be back home with your family. And so that's actually maybe even a better way to conceptualize the distances is that it is a long time. And so, um, you know, Learning how to do that and getting the technology and development, it's expensive, and figuring out who you who you work with all across this planet to do it and all that. That's really the big focus here. Now there are some policy things. I mean, you know, we've never really been on another planet, and so one of the things people really worry about is that you know they we're concerned there's life on Mars. And that's exciting. That's actually really cool. Uh -huh. On the other hand, it could be bad. I mean, it could be like a plague. And so, you know, we want to make sure that we understand what that, if that biology exists, we want to try to understand it. Um, and then we want to be able to understand if there are any risks. I personally don't believe there are risks, but we have to prove that or try to do that. And it may be that we won't even know that answer till really smart, creative human beings are there who can look under a rock and say, ooh, that doesn't look right. Because we don't know what life on Mars is. It could be completely different than what we have grown to believe it to be on the Earth. So I would, that, that, that's a sort of a policy piece that we're really thrashing about right now, too, and it's an important discussion. Wow, and I think that, that uh, Ms. Cunningham's class, there was a comment there, says we are yeah. thinking about the exploration of North America and comparing it to the space explorers of today, yeah. which is quite a long trip, isn't it? I mean, it's quite ironic. <laughs> so so uh, that's a great question. And, you know, like Lewis and Clark, that expedition, you know, and there was expeditions by LaSalle, who's a Frenchman down the Mississippi All River. Right. But someone's going to ask the question, because if they are, oh, they're, okay. I don't know. Um, uh, Ms. Cunningham, yeah. did, did someone want to ask the question themselves? Did you have a specific question, guys? No, we were just talking, thank you, we were just talking about how people left their homes and their families and they didn't quite know what to explore and just getting there was quite the trip and then they had to do all their exploration when they got there. You know, so uh, two comments, I totally agree with that and I would say, um, so one thing, you know, these guys who went out, men and women who went out, they they were going a long time. I, they were very comparable to Mars missions really when you get down to it. I think Lewis and Clark were out two years, you know. Um, it was scary, too. I mean, I, I grew up in the state of Virginia in the United States. Um, Jamestown was where the first settlers really set up the first base. You know, they screwed up picking up the base, too, I might add, um, because it's really kind of on a little island. That doesn't, in fact, now it's an archaeological dig because they left the place. You know, but the point being is that, um, you know, the first, uh, between 1607 and 1623, I think the number, roughly speaking numbers, is 20,000 people came to Jamestown. You know, I remember we were alive at the end of 1623, 2,000. 
So it was a 90% mortality rate, you know. And every place on this planet that's had exploration, you know, has similar types of stories of the beginning, you know. And, you know, Mars is equally dangerous. It's, it's kind of funny because I grew up, you know, in the, in the human spaceflight area where you go in space is dangerous and on the surface is safe, you know, the surface being Earth. You know, it's funny because a lot of my um, uh, the co colleagues actually, when they think about Mars, do the same thing. They say, "In space is safe," or "You know, in space is dangerous, on the surface is safe." And in point of fact, Mars is deadly. If with our current level of technology, we don't really know how to make Mars do what Mars wants to do. That it allows us to live and survive. And so, in space is probably space safe. <laughs> on the planet is dangerous till we get a lot smarter. And and frankly. It's the kids in you know your all's classrooms that are going to help us figure it out because we just don't know it and 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 we need, there's a lot that we just don't know. Wow. Well, I mean, I know that for me, you know, obviously Mars is a is a fascinating uh, beacon of of adventure. It really is the the pinnacle of of where we're heading. And and your plans are to to not just land on Mars, but to actually colonize Mars for a short while. And then come back and bring samples with you. Yeah. But then we spoke to Carrie Corrigan last night, who works at the Smithsonian, and she's got pieces of Mars, and she's had them for a couple of years because meteorites have landed on Earth and yes. literally got them at her fingertips. So, th so the difference is, yes, she, we have. It's really, you know, we've had things that smashed into Mars that, you know, kicked up so much junk that that actually some of it ended up here on the Earth. When it comes into the Earth atmosphere, it you know goes through a lot of heat, and it gets um, essentially uh, uh, it's a lot to be learned from it. But it's not the same thing as going to Mars and pulling up a pristine sample that hadn't been burned in an atmosphere, if you will. And so we are extremely interested in, in getting samples from Mars because it may tell us that life existed there or exists now. You know, it may tell us. Uh, one of the things I love to say about Mars that's uh, really key is that, you know, we have an amazing planet here that we live on. I mean, it is essentially a planet that is designed to keep people alive. I mean, our whole biology just, just it, it's like being in a womb you know, or a home when you're a teenager. I mean, it's like everything's there, you know. But the reality is we're sort of banking our knowledge of this planet on one data point our one planet and by learning about Mars and all the other planets and even other solar systems with other planets eventually we're developing a whole lot of other data points that will hopefully tell teach us how to even take care of this planet better um, that you just won't get until you see the really funky weird things that happen on other planets that make you realize ooh this could happen to Earth too if we're not careful. <laughs> well I mean a lot of the things that that are difficult to get your head around is obviously the the danger of of getting there, um, and and we're talking about 2030, which is obviously 14 years from now. It's not you know um, uh, like near. We're talking when some of the students in in Mr. McNulty's class or in Miss Cunningham's class are actually going to be adults. They could be potentially the next astronaut to go to Mars. Yeah, like how old are your how old are the students? I can't really see on the picture. So, so Mrs. Can... Cunningham, how old are your students? Well, how old are you? Eleven. 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 Oh, you guys are like perfect for it. You know, so let's say we go in nineteen years. I mean, you're going to be the age that most young astronauts are when they get picked to go on a really cool flight like this. So, you know, you you, you could be the ones. <laughs> They're interesting. <laughs> look, look, look at the hands. I love it. I love it. And Mr. McNulty, how old are your students? 13. 13. 13. Uh, two years difference doesn't matter. You guys are all rock. You're gonna be doing. You could be the ones doing it. And if you're not the ones actually going, you know, you, there is so much cool work to be done to get a, a, these missions ready to go. I mean, whether you're interested in science or math or computers or whatever. I mean, the fact of the matter is, let's talk computers because I those are just people do not realize that when we send them to Mars. We need the, these computers to be super smart. They need to be helping these human beings make decisions there, not having dependent on human beings all the way back, you know, 70 million, 100 million, or even further miles away. 
you know, so we, 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 those computers would better be amazing. And so the people who design them and then create them, there is every bit as a part, much a part of the mission as the people who actually walk on the planet. Well, I mean, I'm just thinking now, you know, if you go back to when uh, Neil Armstrong first took a step on, on the moon, uh, that was a big deal for many, many, many years. Oh, uh, yeah. But none of these kids would know about it because they were too young. Yeah. They are now going to be at the age where they will witness the first human being to step on Mars. And that is a huge deal. Well, Steve, I would go one step further. I would just say two things. Um, they uh, will witness that. Maybe, maybe, maybe we can talk you into participating. Um, mm -hmm. and, and not only that, but you're, Mars is probably the only place in this solar system, we're kind of lucky in this regard, where the human beings really can be self-sufficient. You can't really do that on the moon because there's no atmosphere on the moon. Mars, you know, it, it's hard, but it, you have an atmosphere, you have water, you in large quantities, you have all these things. It's not easy, but going to Jamestown wasn't easy, or going to Cape Town wasn't easy either. Mm -hmm. You know, and the point being is that um, it's the first. It's you know, like the only planet where we can actually um, become a multi-planetary species. You know what? And I think when you look a thousand years back from now. And you look at what that means when a species becomes multi-planetary. We don't know because we're not right now. But when mm -hmm. we do, and when you look up in the night sky and you see a little blue dot up there, and you know that's the mother planet, but that you've actually created another planet that actually supports human beings, that is an amazing transition. And I just don't think, as human beings, we really know what that means. But it's, I think, I think we intuitively we know it's pretty daggone cool. Well, I know that Robert in Mr. McNulty's class, he would like to know if, if what it means to find a, a, another planet. So, where's Robert? You're going to come up and ask your question. Cool. Oh. I, um, I heard on the, that, like, you can, that we found a super planet that's kind of like Mars, but it's not in our solar system. So, um, we are getting really good at seeing planets around other stars. You know, that is literally like new in the last, you know, five, seven years where we have actually, there's some really cool tricks you can use. They are way far away, but we can see where the star gets um, sort of yanked around a little bit, and it's because planets are going around it. And we can even see the planets, it, it, the little black dots going across the star, which tells us they're there. And we're beginning to figure out how to see some planets as small as the Earth down there. And then these things are so far away, it's really hard to do it, and it takes a lot of creativity to do it. But we know there are other solar systems that, that we're finding them literally every day. And we are, and no doubt we will find ones that have um, uh, Earth-like planets. They may even have different kinds of planets that have intelligent life that we just, it's so different that we just don't know how to deal with it. You know, we get kind of, you get kind of used to, you know, uh, what we know. Um, and the reality is one of the things that's neat about the space frontier is that you, we just don't know all the answers. And so we do know this. We know that life will exist in rocks in Antarctica, will, will evolve and just turn into all kinds of really cool forms. And there's no reason to believe that intelligent life doesn't do the same thing throughout the entire universe. Wow. Well, I, I, another question that was coming from, and we had... Um, Dondi from Hungary, who's just left, but uh, we had a, another question from uh, Bodhi. Uh, hey, he Bodhi. wants to do ask. So let me switch him over, and he can ask his question. Thanks, um, what are the main factors holding us back from reaching Mars? Like, it doesn't seem like new news. It's making lots of new discoveries, and it's like, what's the main factor that makes it, that thing like in 20 years from now? That make it hard for us to go, Bodhi. Yes. So there's actually a lot of things that make it hard. Um, so I'll just tell you a couple that we're working on. When you uh, land a spaceship on Mars, so when you land on Earth, you know that used to be really scary, but we've gotten really good at doing it. But one thing that's amazing is that you have an atmosphere that actually helps slow you down. At Mars, the atmosphere is it's there, but it's like being up at about I'm making up a number, but it's about right about a hundred thousand feet in an airplane. There's not it's not real thick, and the problem with that is that it's thick enough that it can, you can bounce off of it if you're not careful. That's that's bad news, and the other one is that it's thin enough that you can't really use it to slow you up. 
real well. And so we have to kind of learn how to slow up in there so we don't crash the spacecraft in there. And that's really hard. Um, but, it, we, but we are learning to do it with our robots that we send there. Another thing that we just don't know is that, you know, I told you there are these old oceans. Those oceans are, you know, um, we know even kind of roughly where they were because of this, the instruments we've flown. But we don't, um, because of the uh, radars that we've flown to already, we don't really know exactly where they end. And so we really need a satellite, for example, at Mars to help us figure out where it is. Because you don't want to be really way far north. You know how it is, like when you go to uh, you know, the North Pole, it gets pretty daggone cold up there. You know, and it's miserable. Same thing happens on Mars. It, um, it gets so cold on Mars that carbon dioxide fr freezes and becomes carbon dioxide snow, and that is really cold. And you're talking meters of it, you know, in the winter time. So it, it's a pretty miserable thing. So you want to get the people as far south as you can because it's warmer, um, but you also want them to have access to the water. So we need to know that. Um, I would say another thing is, you know, keeping people happy and productive. You know, when they're that, that far away from Earth and their families and their, you know, and their, all the people they love and care about, that's really not, that's, you know, we're learning a lot on the space station, but it's tricky. You know, um, you know I, I can tell you from personal experience, you know, that when we send people up to the space station and they're getting ready to come home, you know, they get, um, they get, well, actually, while they're on the space station, is before they get kind of lonely up there. And and before we had six-person crews on the space station, we only had three. It could get kind of challenging, particularly if you didn't speak the other person's language very well. And so, learning to work with that and make sure that they are happy and productive all the way out there and back um, is really key. And picking the right people to go because not everybody's set up to do that. So those are just some examples of some of the things we really have to kind of learn how to do before we, you know, really, you know, are ready to send them. I don't know. Did that answer your question, buddy? It was a good one. It was definitely a good one. That's great. Um, I know that uh, Miss Cunningham's class, uh, who, I don't know who it was that asked the question, but maybe they want to stand up and ask the question. Come in front of the camera. There we go. Okay. How many degrees is it on Mars? So it's a, um, on a warm day down near the equator, which is the warmest place, it gets up to a little over freezing. You know, but then it can drop, you know, like, I think, uh, I want to say 120 degrees at night, something like that. It gets really cold. Um, cool. You know, so it's there's a whole range. And then what's really amazing is we got to have equipment and that actually can handle that. And du Mars, actually, is kind of cool. It, it can have these dust storms. Yeah, did, did you see the movie The Martian? You guys see The Martian? Yeah, so those dust storms are not never as bad as that. I mean, it, you know, but that, they do have dust storms, and they, that dust gets in equipment. We know from our rovers that the dust can be a real problem, so learning how to do that kind of stuff. You know, we'll figure it out, or you guys will figure it out, you know, but the bottom line is um, those things are manageable. And, uh, okay. Yeah. Are yeah, there, what else do you want to ask? Are there seasons? Mm -hmm. Yes, there are seasons. Um, it actually has, um, because the planet is tilted more than the Earth is, their seasons are much more pronounced than, than our seasons are. Um, it can get, you know, like in the wintertime, it can get pretty nasty. Um, and that's another reason why we want to push, you know, push where we put the people low, is further south. But again, we, we're probably going to want them to have access to the water, too. So we're figuring out how to do that. Um, you know, and it, it'll, uh, you'll get not only snow of carbon dioxide, but you'll get snow of water. There is water in the atmosphere, too. Um, even It's kind of thin, but it, you'll get actual real snow developing, too. Wow. And then, of course, Rocco in Mr. McNulty's class, he's got a question cool. uh, about private companies. Rocco, you want to fire away? <laughs> Hi. So recently there's been talk of a Mars mission headed by private companies, the Mars yep. one. So what's your opinion on this? I think it totally rocks, you know. Um, yeah. So the, what I would say is that Mars is not about one country or one space agency going. It's about humans going. And I, act, I think that I, I really think I speak for NASA. We have really changed the way we look at it, and I think a lot of space agencies are beginning to change it. Is that you know really we want to be um, this is the space is the new economy, you know. Um, and so like uh, when SpaceX or um, or, or there are several other companies and now they're doing um, delivering supplies to the space station. When they first started doing it, it was like, oh, you know, does that really? You know, but you know what? They totally rock at it. They they're getting the cost down. They they are they're building up things. They're actually they're going to even have their own astronauts eventually. 
you know, and so it just creates a lot of great opportunities. And I personally believe that as we go out to the out to what we call Cislunar, which is kind of the area around Mars, which is really where the Mars transfer vehicles will launch from. There are a lot of reasons for that. Um, and then we'll build up like a port there. And I, if, if American and foreign, you know, other countries, companies are not involved there, I actually think we probably fail because that is the that is a massive opportunity for them to actually really do creative, great things that are going to drive cost down and make it possible. And the same thing is I fully expect companies to be involved, like uh, delivering supplies to the Martian system, maybe to the Mar I even say to the Martian surface. And I know, like, if you talk with the guys at SpaceX, they're, they're fully intending to do it. And I have no doubt they'll get there. You know, they may crash one or two in there, but you know what? They crashed one or two on the on, trying to land on a ship, and now they're doing something that nobody else has ever done. They've done it two times in a row. You know, and wow. so I, they will get there, and a lot of other companies will get there, too. Hopefully that answers your question. And, I mean, obviously there's a good chance that, that uh, as you say, a private individual might be first to land on Mars way before any of the agencies because of, I mean, if you look at the growth of NASA from yeah. when it first started to where you are now and the developments of the technology, and then you take a company like SpaceX, literally in a short space of time, they've achieved so much, and yet it's literally only a couple of years. So, so the only thing I would say there, though, is that, so <laughs> it's kind of funny, they, when they first started going to the space station to deliver supplies, they did not, um, they, they, we actually put them next to our guys at NASA, and that we, they, our guys essentially taught them tons of stuff. Do not get me wrong, they brought tons of new ideas to the table, too, but it was really completely together that they essentially did it. And I think they would tell you this, that it was a very a team effort. And the same thing will happen at Mars. You know, who actually walks first, you know, it doesn't, you know, really matter if you're trying to become a multi-planetary species, but I fully anticipate uh, companies to be part of that process. In fact, I don't, I'm not sure we can do it if we don't, if we don't figure out a way to bring in everybody who wants to play. Sure. And then, of course, we, we have a, a couple of other questions. Uh, let's have a look here. And I think yeah. Tony's group have, have just joined us as well. I'm just going to put and that Jim, on mute. Jim Gray just joined us too. Oh, and Jim has joined us. It's perfect timing. Okay, yeah. so I was just going to introduce everyone to, to, to Jim. Uh, this is uh, Jim Green. He is NASA's planetary expert, and he's the director of planetary sciences. Not only that, but he also gets to, to go to all these fun Congress meetings and, and <laughs> pretend that he's doing work, but... But actually, his real passion is, is sharing knowledge about space and planets and science, and, and he knows a lot of secrets that we haven't read <laughs> on the internet yet. And, and, and we're going to pick his brain, uh, because I know that Rick has, has shared a wealth of information, but Jim knows a lot of stuff that maybe even Rick doesn't know. He's kept it a bit of it to himself. <laughs> they do that sort of thing, but he's going to share these secrets with you, which I think is quite exciting. So, so now Ava has asked a wonderful question. How many people are we going to send to Mars? And are they already picked out? Yeah, go ahead. I mean, I'm, I'll throw my two yeah. cents in right away. The people that are going to Mars for the very first time are alive today. We may not know exactly who they are, but they're out there. And uh, we started that process to find them. Well, they could be in those classrooms that have joined us. Yeah, too. right. Um, and I would say and, that is, they have not been picked, obviously. Um, and then the other thing is we, we're, our plan is to kind of send four at a time on each crew. Um, we've kind of learned that three is not a great number. You really want a little more so you can get more sort of a, uh, a sort of a community there. That seems to work better. On the space station, when we used to have three people, we always had problems. When we jumped to six, no problems at all. I mean, it was amazing. You could always, there was a whole sort of dynamic of, finding people that you can interact with, and really it became a much easier thing in terms of a crew. Number four, the Beatles. Uh, you start <laughs> to think of yeah. bands that obviously come in fours. Um, and, and then uh, Kyle mentioned that obviously uh, we're going to be interviewing astronaut Abby uh, next week. She's very keen to be one of those four. Now, I mean, the chances of that happening, and that's obviously something that, uh, that we'll be speaking about, you know, she's obviously putting all the checks in, in the right places. She's studying what she needs to study. She's meeting all the right people because she wants to be an astronaut. 
but she's going to stand in line because there's a long line of people who want to be the first. <laughs> there are even people who are willing to go on a one-way mission to Mars. They just want to get their foot on Mars. They don't care what happens afterwards. Well, you know, How NASA, do you guys deal with that? <laughs> yeah, NASA has a process for which uh, during the training, uh, the astronauts are subjected to a whole variety of uh, new experiences. Uh, those are not only um, from a mental point of view, uh, but also a physical uh, and um, even even the ability to interact socially. You know, um, I, I mentioned this um, one little thing about The Martian that I really loved. You know, the movie The Martian, and that is. That Ares crew was tight, yeah. you know, and that crew uh, was a team, and they were all, you know, type A personalities. Any one of them could have led, uh, but the they each knew when to follow, and even Watney on the surface was part of the team. Even Mitch Henderson back at headquarters was part of that Ares team, and and they they thought the same way. They worked together and. Uh, uh, that that's what's going to happen when we send a group to Mars. They're going to be a team. They're going to be a NASA team. Now, some movies you see, you know, are all about well, you got to have some conflict, and so you have one team <laughs> member fighting another. <laughs> Ain't gonna happen. All right, yeah. NASA will uh -huh. weed those people out, and they won't be going to Mars. But wow. and we we may have to so just to build on what Jim's saying, we might have to kind of learn how to pick that team too. Because when we picked people for the space shuttle missions, it was one type. Then when we jumped to the space station, we had to kind of rethink the way we did that because, I mean, they were locked in a can for six months at a time. They were getting international. Um, they trained a month in the States and a month in Russia, and then they go to all, Japan and Europe. And so that's it really required a different kind of person. And I'm, I'm betting that when we pick the team that, that Jim describes, we'll have re we had to relearn that, too, to figure out how you really build that, that team that works like he describes. But even when you've sent them, the dynamics can change. Two people can fall in love. And then they can also fall out of love. And then you have a small problem on the space station or on Mars. Well, you know, that's what I say. Uh, the personal interactions are, are, are going to be critical. Um, you um, you develop a rapport, you develop a sense of uh, camaraderie, um, and in that is a, is a genuine appreciation and love, if you will, of every one of the teammates that you have. Now, you actually can experience this yourself. <laughs> no, I'm serious. Mm -hmm. by, by, go, by having a small select group go through a common, tough experience, mm. okay? Now, um, uh, this could be, you know, a, a tough uh, a hike, uh, the, you know, through um, uh, tough areas, uh, multi-day, um, uh, uh, things where you end up relying on others and their experience and the beginning to appreciate what each and every one of those people bring to the team. And uh, the astronauts are going to have that kind of experience. And uh, uh, NASA will put them through their paces. Mm -hmm. So uh, that indeed is a part of it. And we would just say that NASA probably would, but then SpaceX might get there 10 years before NASA's actually done that. You never know. I mean, <laughs> these private companies are, 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 are moving and shaking, and they like to, to get things done. But I want to just take Jim back a little bit. <laughs> I want to yeah. take Jim back a little bit because now that Jim has joined us, um, can you tell us a little bit more about what it is that you actually do at right. uh, NASA? Okay. So I am the Director of Planetary Science at NASA. So mm -hmm. um, I work full-time in planetary science. I am the top advocate in the federal government for planetary science. And so that's any of our Mars missions, any, any of our missions that are going to Pluto or Mercury or anything in, in between. So um, uh, I also am involved in planning the future for the field. So everything that we do as we move forward starts in this building on this floor and in my group. <laughs> wow. And, and, and so, um, uh, and we have a lot of input and, and we have a lot of things that we do, And uh, but we have chartered a course uh, to move forward and we're executing that. 
So not only do we receive the money and then distribute it back out to the centers so that they can actually build and launch and, and, and get the missions together, but we're also planning for the next set. So we actually play a pretty important part of uh, the overall uh, space mission area in planetary science. Well, I would say it's a little, a little bit more than pretty important. I mean, it's, it's quite a huge thing. Um, and I know that there are lots of questions coming through from, from the groups. We're going to get to those questions. I just want to go back a little bit further. Um, what the did you study great, and, and to, to get? I mean, we know we're only talking about five or six years. What did you study to get to where you are now? And did you always want to work in space? Well, the That's space really, industry. Yeah, yeah. So mm -hmm. I, I grew up in the 60s. All right. I mean, that was... Uh, that was the year of Star Trek. Ten Tra years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, that was the year of Star Trek. I mean, the original TV show. I watched everything from the first <laughs> episode onward. All right? Mm -hmm. In high school, uh, I took an after-school astronomy class because uh, our chemistry professor uh, ended up with the keys uh, to an <laughs> observatory. It was a 12-inch Alvin Clark refractor. In I love this. A small high school in Iowa, okay, the center the center of the United States. You take a pin and stick it there right in the center. That's where I was. And so um, in the evenings, you know, at night, I had an opportunity to use that telescope, and I made all sorts of observations uh, uh, and, and, in fact, uh, uh, developed a, a set of instruments, made a, a variety of uh, images, photographs, and, and um, uh, Mercury Transit. My very first Mercury Transit I saw through that telescope on May 9th, 1970, <laughs> all right? So um, uh, I, I, I even got things published in Sky and Telescope. So when I left uh, my high school career and went on to the University of Iowa, I knew exactly what I wanted to do, and that was to get an astronomy degree, which I did. I got an undergraduate degree in astronomy and um, uh, went on to um, uh, space physics for my graduate degree and got my master's and PhD there. So I stayed at the University of Iowa and I found out that they were doing astronomy from spacecraft. <laughs> they, didn't, they didn't have to wait at, late at night for Orion to come up or whatever it happened to be. So um, I loved that and uh, I was immersed in the space program while I was there. Well, what, what is interesting is that from all the people that I've been interviewing over the last couple of weeks and, and obviously before that, I always ask the origin story because every great superhero story has a good origin story. And what I find fascinating is that there's always a serendipitous event, some sort of catalyst that brings someone away from the path that they intended and leads them to where they are today. So would it be safe to say that as a science communicator, that if I expose young kids to various different things all the time, one of those things might hook them and hopefully lead them into something in the STEM field. Yeah, you never can tell what, what will trigger that, that aha moment <laughs> that, oh man, I want to be a part of this. Yeah. Um, uh, so uh, a broad set of experiences are incredibly important. Now, even though I went to the University of Iowa, where James mm -hmm. Van Allen was there, and James Van Allen was the um, uh, first scientist that had a very successful uh, experiment on Explorer 1, discovered the Van Allen radiation belts. You know, and I was going to be an astronomer, a ground-based astronomer. My very first class as a freshman was with Van Allen, and it was, um, uh, you know, 400 students in this huge area, um, and it was Astronomy 101. It was a wonderful course, had a great, great time, and, and really didn't interact with him much. I didn't think I distinguished myself, although I got an A. And then second semester, I signed up for a course called Readings in Astronomy. And that was taught by staff. And usually when you see that in the course catalog, that means it's going to be a um, graduate student teaching it. And uh, I went to the class, and it turned out to be Van Allen's office, and I was the only one that signed up for the course, and he knew all about me. You know, wow. he'd been watching me in the Astronomy 101. And then uh, when we talked, I told him all the stuff I did. One of the things I did with the telescope was I took an image of the sun every day for three months straight. And um, he got really excited about it and, and said, hey, let's do some research with that. And I, I didn't know what that meant. What, is, what, what do you do? 
And so, indeed, what I did was, a, 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 this was during solar maximum in 1969, I looked at all the sunspots and I, I did solar rotation. So I measured solar rotation with these sunspots. He made me write a science paper, just like it was the very first paper on sunspot rotation ever. Wow. He was the referee. I correct, you know, I went through the corrections and everything else, and that could have been published in, you know, geophysical research letters by the time I got done. And at the end of that, I was hooked on research. It, it, it was just a spectacular, spectacular experience for me. So obviously the importance of having a mentor, someone who you look up to, that also gives you a gentle push in the right direction is critical, without a doubt. Well, um, now, absolutely. Yeah? You, you know, sometimes you have to seek those experiences. They don't just happen. So being focused, being interested, and, and working to your strengths leads you to those people. And I would even it's, add, don't be afraid to ask stupid questions. Absolutely. You know, if, well, if I mean, there's no such thing as a stupid question. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, that's the way you actually find cool opportunities is by sort of saying, you know, I mean, I once had an astronomy class. And the professor, basically, they were out of grad students, and he jokingly he said, does anyone want to work at the observatory? I didn't realize he was joking. I raised my hand, and I got, <laughs> and so as an undergrad, I got to go work at the observatory. Good. And it was just a great experience. Yeah. And that's probably right. the reason why I'm doing space stuff now. That is awesome. So now, uh, Jim, I want to just ask you, there have been some new planets that have been discovered, and, and a lot written about them, but what is the latest information that we should know? And is there another Earth? And who is Planet X or Planet Nine? What is going on with all these new things that are being announced? Okay. Wow. So let me try to say it succinctly in a few minutes. Mm -hmm. The announcement today from Kepler. Let's see. Is that uh, that's in ten minutes? I can't talk about it yet. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So I'll go to a different topic. Different topic. Okay. okay. So let's talk about our our solar system. Uh, our solar system, uh, there's some indication that there might be a body way out there, maybe 900 astronomical units away, where an astronomical unit is the distance from our planet to the sun, mm -hmm. 900 AU away that uh, is uh, a scatterer. And this is a big planet. This would be something like the, a little bit smaller than Neptune. But it's been um, pushing around some Kuiper Belt objects that we find mm. really unusual orbits. And so uh, uh, this idea uh, came about by looking at these unusual orbits uh, that we were finding in Kuiper Belt objects and then, and then theorizing what it took to do that. And one out of several ideas is a big planet scattering. So this is called Planet X. Uh -huh. The original term, Planet X, actually comes from Percival Lowell. Percival Lowell uh, who was at uh, uh, you know the, the observatory in Flagstaff was making observations not only of Mars you know with the canals but also um, uh, looking at variations in Uranus's orbit as if there was another planet in addition to Neptune that's pushing it around and so after you know like 60 or 70 pages of equations where X equals whatever and that was where the planet's position was he said, this is where this planet should be, go find it. He died uh, soon after he, he finished that, and they hired Clyde Tombaugh to be able to find Planet X. And Planet X at that time was Pluto, <laughs> and Clyde found it. Now, only since then have we really gone back and redid all those calculations and realized that the variation in Neptune's orbit, uh, Pluto couldn't do. And so that was within the measurement error. So it just turned out to be a, s a series of lucky occurrences that Clyde actually came up finding Pluto. But Pluto was supposed to be more Earth size. It's not. It's actually smaller than the moon. And now that we've visited it, 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 it is so fascinating. It's, a brand, it's an object in a brand new environment beyond Neptune that we now call the Kuiper Belt. This is leftover material from the from our collapsing cloud and these icy rich bodies are just spectacular to, to look at and discover as Pluto is. Now Planet 9 we haven't found. You know, so I've challenged the, uh, the planetary community if it's out there go find it. <laughs> oh, okay, so we haven't it. found it yet. <laughs> yeah, well they, they, 
you know, they narrowed down the search space. Rather than looking everywhere in the sky, these calculations that were done on scattered Kuiper Belt objects seem to indicate there's a certain preferred direction. So that helps enormously. Uh, so um, Mike Brown, who I know pretty well, that we fund actually uh, some of the things that he does, tells me that in about two years we hope to be able to find it if it's out there. Now when you talk to a lot of the planetary dynamicists, the people that really are the tops in the, in the country on, on planet scattering and resonances and everything that happened in the solar system, what's the chances that it's there? They would say one in a hundred. So don't get, don't get your hopes up that it's there. <laughs> but if it is, it'll be truly a wonderful discovery in planetary science. It'll just be huge. But we would never get there because it would take too long to get there anyway. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> don't say that. that. <laughs> I'm kidding. No, I mean, no, no, of no, course, no, 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 we, no, no. we could never say never because Elon Musk has already right. got a rocket and he's waiting to launch it. If it's not the grasshopper, it'll be some other creature and, and, and it'll probably get there. So now, you okay. obviously, because, because of the Humans to Mars Summit coming up in, in May, um, you obviously know a little bit about Mars, but what was interesting is that the team that made the Martian movie, they came to speak to you yeah, to, to, to make sure that whatever they portrayed was <laughs> realistic. What were the kinds of pieces of advice that you gave them to, to, to give the audience? I mean, as you know, when you're reading a book, you use your own imagination, but when you're actually watching a movie, uh, you have to put all the pieces in place right. for the viewer to understand exactly what right. they're seeing. Were we seeing your vision? Or was, <laughs> this, or was this the vision of the graphic team? Or was it a combination? What was the kind of advice you gave them? Yeah, so uh, uh, Ridley Scott came, uh, approached us. Uh, uh, I happened to talk to him first, um, uh, which I was just delighted to do. Uh, you know, one of my favorite movies is Alien. I mean, yeah, you were talking a really good movie. And uh -huh. um, uh, so I knew right away in, in talking to him exactly what he wanted to do. He wanted to paint a realistic picture of Mars and, and many elements that NASA's currently planning to do, from habitats to vehicles to uh, uh, ISRU, which is uh, extracting material in situ research utilization, it's called, extracting material to be able to use and live off the land. So um, once, once I knew that, it was easy because all we had to do then is say, all right, here's the look and feel of Mars. Here's uh, everything from how you'd handle radioisotope power systems to what our vehicles look like, to what our suits look like, to what our, our HABs look like, and some of the new ideas that we're, we're investigating right now, our ion engines, you know, everything. And, he, and, and so um, I had several uh, tel long telephone conversations with him, and then I took um, uh, his team. Uh, uh, they went to several centers. Uh, our first one was at Johnson Space Center in Houston, and we had uh, a wonderful day really uh, looking at all the mock-ups and, and some of the things that NASA's planning to do at Mars. So he took that and, and with his creative uh, staff, really cast that into a look and feel that was beautiful. And they looked uh, all over the world for the right sets. I think they got a great set uh, setting, you know, where, where the landscape is actually part of, you know, one of the characters, you know. Mm -hmm. you, know when, you know, when Mark Watney gets and sits down and looks over and he, he says, um, you know, uh, uh, every day I, I sit and I, I look and I watch the sunset because I can. <laughs> and it's on another world and it's just beautiful. And uh, he's right. You know, Mars, is, uh, Mars has some fabulous vistas, some fabulous things. So um, my participation was really uh, quite, quite easy. Um, they really knew what they wanted to do, and 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 that fit really well with um, um, uh, everything we knew about Mars, and 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 so, and the first script I read, I, there there was two major scripts. The first script I read, I made about twenty five suggestions, okay, and um, they ended up taking a couple, <laughs> uh, ignoring the rest because they mm -hmm. also wanted to be faithful to the book, of course, and so uh, that was great, you know. It's science fiction, and uh, 
that uh, that allowed him to stay on schedule, on budget, uh, add a few things along the way, and and off we go. And I think the the, the award winning movie is a testament to uh, to that work that they did. It was great. That was a great movie. I mean, do you sit there and and, and go? Uh, just between you and I, that was my idea, that whole little rocket thingy there. And, and that painting, I mean, it was a graphic design, but it, it, I, I suggested the rock. I mean, do you do you have those little subtle personal esoteric experiences that you keep to yourself? Or? I do. I do. I'm sure. I'm sure. I mean, they were going to cast me, but I said Matt Damon, Matt Damon, and they went with Matt Damon. I mean, it happens, you know. Well, <laughs> and, I, did, and, I, I, mean, didn't re I didn't meet Matt Damon until... Um, the premiere night in Toronto. I was invited to go to the premiere. So mm -hmm. I was invited to go to the pre-party. Okay. And so it was at seven o'clock. The movie was going to be at nine. And uh, and so uh, at at five after seven and I was just fretting like crazy. How come I couldn't get together, you know, my act together and get over there at seven o'clock and at five to seven I walk in the place completely empty. I'm the first one there. <laughs> okay. And I, I realized they're all on Hollywood time, you know. So <laughs> at seven o'clock, this is really going to start until late. <laughs> uh -huh. So, so I had a great time eating all the food. I mean, I had all, every, all the servers bringing me food right and left. I mean, I was perfect, you know. I just stuffed myself. Went over to the potato bar and a nice little potato <laughs> bar, you know, uh, and uh, everything you can imagine. You could eat potatoes any way you wanted to. <laughs> so I, I mean, I had a great time. So uh, uh, it turns out I was to walk the red carpet first, okay? Uh -huh. and, and Matt Damon was to walk the red carpet last. And so uh, about 8.30, um, the, the limo shows up outside the, uh, the, 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 this area, and they, they escort me out, and I'm walking out. Matt Damon walks in. Okay, now he walks in the place. First 20 feet, he's absolutely mobbed. Everybody uh -huh. wants to you know, FaceTime with Matt Damon. So, so we're walking out, and, it was, and I was just about ready to pass him as I walked out the door to get in the limo to walk the red carpet. And, and, and the place opens up, so I just jumped right in. <laughs> I'm that, you know, I'm, I'm a consultant on the film, and I pull out a NASA meatball pin, okay? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And I give it to him, give it to him, and I said, I'm going to make you an honorary NASA employee. <laughs> Man, he took it out, put it on right away, and now I have that is an awesome. You know, put it, you know, put it right there, and uh, and we chatted a little bit, uh, and that was it. Now, since then, I've talked to him several times since then, but but that was my first meeting, and so any interview that I see Matt Damon give on The Martian, I look and see if he has the NASA pen, on, <laughs> and then I know what night he gave it. <laughs> that is awesome. That is awesome. Well, I know we've we've got about. Because I know we're going to be interviewing Dr. Penny Boston at quarter past uh, the hour. So we've still got a few more minutes before we snap into the next hangout. You know, we'd like to push as many as we can in, in, in one go. Um, is there any parting advice you would like to give young, aspiring people? Because I know that you probably don't want to be astronauts yourselves. You're quite happy with the work that you're currently doing. Or do you have aspirations to be an astronaut? Do you think that maybe... You know, if Senator John Glenn can do it, you guys can still hop on and, and go for one quick trip to the moon. I mean, why not? I mean, you've got all the knowledge and the experience. You know, you've probably done a little bit of the training yourself as well. Sure. Uh, if that opportunity, uh, you know, uh, presents itself, uh, uh, then I'll be able to make that decision. <laughs> but uh, unfortunately, it probably won't present itself. Uh, so I'll have to be content staying on Earth and, and planning our robotic missions and, and doing everything I can to provide the data that we come from those missions that will help human exploration down their risk, make it successful, allow them to live and work on Mars and do even more science. Uh -huh. Well, I do have a, a, a hope that in the next couple of weeks I will be interviewing Elon and I'll, I'll maybe make a mention of the fact that you know commercial space travel could facilitate your, your, your one objective, uh, you know, just in case it is something that you, you aspire to do. But now, what is the, the advice that you would give young people in terms of getting involved in space and, and the sciences and obviously STEM and, and that type of thing? Well, you know, there's no substitute for um, a, a really good background, uh, becoming an expert, you know, uh, uh, studying hard, 
uh, this is uh, math, science, uh, and engineering. But you know, NASA needs all all walks of life. You know, uh, uh, all sorts of capabilities. You'd be tremendously surprised by the the array of of uh, capabilities that NASA has. So uh, you can always look and see what those opportunities are uh, as um, uh, as they might arise uh, in the United States through a variety of the websites. But I have to tell you one thing that's the most important, even with all mm -hmm. that aside. It's just, you know, it's like uh, the movie uh, City Slickers. It's uh, the one thing. The one thing. <laughs> the one thing. And in my life, it's determination. All right? That makes all the difference in the world. I had a, I had a breaks the resistance. Yeah, I had a supervisor walk into my office one day. You know, after I'd been working on a particular stuff, and he goes, God, don't you know when to quit? You know, I can't make that happen. And I said, it never occurred to me that I couldn't make that happen. You know, never occurred to me. And in fact, I did make it happen. And, 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 <laughs> that is good and advice. That. Um, but obviously it's about, you know, you know, if young kids have are goal-orientated, that they need to hold steadfast to, to that goal, and not let go because there are going to be many obstacles along the way and if oh, you yeah. take no for an answer you might then lose track and move off on another tangent which is not what you want to do. You want to stay within that orbit of, of the things that you, you're heading towards. Absolutely and, and you know and, and, and sometimes when you're stuck it's, it, it's really okay to ask for advice. It's really okay to seek out an adult or you know, someone that's more closely aligned in the business or activities that you want to do and, and get some advice. There's nothing wrong with that. But, yeah. uh, you know, hold on to your dreams and work towards them. Okay, uh, well, I you, know, you want to say something, Rick? Yeah, I would just add that, you know, following your passions. I mean, that's sort of another way of saying what Jim's saying. But a lot of times the passions may not seem like they, they, um, they support each other, but that's actually part of the creative path that actually... That really makes someone have a unique contribution is they have two different interests and if they can nurture both of them, you, you never know how that's going to kind of come together. And so, Absolutely. being that kind of flexible is really key. I think. I mean, I always say that the one extra little factor that 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 people tend to forget is that, of course, you've got to be determined and you've got to do things that you're passionate about. But but having role models yeah. uh, to stay, you know, it is possible and you can do it is so important, and that's one of the reasons why we are running these hangouts, that young people can connect with, with high-profile people and, and hear from them that it can be done, and that we all went through that process ourselves when we were younger, which was only three years and plus a little bit of that added to that. Um, it was only a couple of years ago, and, and we too had those struggles, and, and it can be done, and that's why it's so important to hear what you guys have to say. Are there oh, any pleasure. parting thoughts you would like to share before we uh, end the broadcast? Well, you know, uh, one, one thing I want to mention, and that is, um, uh, you know, in my lifetime, I've seen so many things change in planetary science. You know, the field is going fantastic. The missions are unbelievable, and it's just the start. The solar system is ours. Let's take it. <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. And you be determined. That, nice <laughs> <laughs> that is brilliant. And and I know that already we've got uh, Mr. McNulty, whose class left. He uh, actually uh, did a, a blog post already on the interview. So we'll I'll send a, an email. But I need to ask you both one small favor. If you can get a little bit closer together. <laughs> and then you've got to look at the camera, not at the screen. Okay. There we go. And I'm going to take a photo. Let me try that again. Uh, here we go. And one more, just in case. Excellent. And I will send you all these photos, and I'll tell you all the tweets and, and all the things that are going on about it. But thank you both very much. Rick, for filling in for the first bit, oh, uh, you certainly, a wow. you you certainly were a very wow. capable uh, filler. You did a wonderful job in, in sharing your passion. <laughs> and of course, Jim, you, you remind me of that risky business where you come sliding in in your socks <laughs> at the last bit, and you still get to strum that imaginary guitar, and, and you had us going, and it was amazing. And, and we really appreciate you know, your, your energy and your enthusiasm. I know that uh, the Humans to Mars Summit is coming up next week and, and you guys are going to be involved. Um, they're going to be playing this interview and all the others that I've done 
on a loop so that people can still get involved and watch what it's all about. But thank you so much for giving up of your time. I know how busy you both are, especially if you're going to Congress and doing that sort of thing. And we appreciate that you took the time to share your knowledge and your information with, with the, our young people. My pleasure. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So I'm going to end the broadcast here.